Okay, welcome tonight to our uh, to our class. We're going to just continue where we left off in the last class. In the last couple of classes, we've been elaborating some on basically the theme of the entire class and bringing it into the singularity of one, into the seed. It's all about, it all has been pointed to this phrase that we have in Galatians, and to thy seed. The promises of God were not made to seeds as of many, but to thy seed which is Christ. And I want to continue on that thought and uh, look at some verses, because right now, as you can if you can uh, remember, we we had like a subtitle to this class, Known of God, and, and we subtitled it, Relate our, our Salvation in View of an Eternal Covenant, or in the Context of an Eternal Covenant. And we've been looking specifically at that covenant, that eternal covenant. And that has everything to do with this, the seed, which is Christ, because it is to that seed And with that seed that God's covenant was made, to that seed that the promises of that covenant were given. And we've been looking at that and we've been reading some verses uh, in the last couple of classes that uh, related to that and that brings that reality into our salvation and, and shows that our salvation and the certainty of it, the security of all that, the blessings and the fullness that has been bestowed in grace to us, is due to the fact that we are born of that seed. That seed lives in us. It is sure to the seed. All the promises of God are sure to the seed. That is why our salvation is by faith in accordance to grace, because the promises and all things are sure to the seed. And we've been looking at that, and tonight we're going to just keep Keep on that thought and and elaborate a little bit on some other verses. Um, What I want to convey in these lessons, and I don't want to get away from, I want us never to lose sight of this, is the certainty of our salvation, the certainty of our relationship with God, is that it is determined and governed by the fact that it is sure to and in the seed who is in us. That the certainty of our salvation is that our salvation is determined and measured in Christ and through Christ and by Christ and not ourselves. Now, we're going to look at Romans 11 tonight. And you'll have to forgive me, I'm, I'm having a little trouble. There's, there's verses here that I want to look at, and I'm having a hard time just getting words to say it, so I hope you'll, you'll forgive me. I'll read some of this stuff right out of the pages and uh, try, to, try to get this thing in an order that is at least capable of presenting it in some way that's uh, not so scattered. But we'll look at this in Romans 11 in a verse that I have never really considered much. But now I'm considering it a whole lot in the light of this covenant. In the light of the fact that this covenant was always with one seed. And that has brought a new light, a new understanding to my, to salvation for me. That everything not only in testimony to Israel, but in fulfillment with us who are born of Christ, born of the Spirit of Christ, those in whom He lives. Everything of God's relation to us is is fully determined and settled in the person of the seed Himself, the person of Christ. And, you know, I I know that people would point at that and and 
say that that is a, a, a cop out, a way to say that it's not, we don't have any responsibilities. But we have the responsibility of knowing and growing in the knowledge of that one who lives in us. That our souls would come to know and experience this great salvation we have in the truth that it is not us but him. That everything of our salvation is embodied in Christ and not ourselves. we said this a lot, but not I but Christ is the truth the moment you were born again. It is not something you finally get to or come to. It is a reality the moment Christ comes to dwell in your soul. It is the Spirit's work to bring our souls to the awareness, to the acknowledgement, to the experiencing of the blessing of not I but Christ. And I say the blessing of not I but Christ because in that reality all blessings are found. The riches of grace, the riches of the inheritance, the riches of all fullness of God is bound up in that reality. It is not I but Christ. That can't just be some mantra we quote. It is a reality we must experience. It's a reality that we must experience inwardly, not just believe mentally or intellectually or theologically. So I want to I want to go into this a little further tonight. And we're going to consider, like I said, some verses in Romans 11. And these are verses that have been mis- misunderstood by myself and by many others. But when we see them in the light, even of the previous verses of of Romans itself, you don't even have to go out of the letter to the Romans and consider what he's talking about. And we've, we've pointed some of them out in previous lessons. How that the faith of God in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, the faith of God is not nullified by the, by the unbelief of the Jew. For the Jew is not one of the flesh, but one of the heart. God's relation... You remember in previous classes we taught that God's relation is the hidden one. The Jew is the hidden one. God's relation is not to the Jew or the Gentile, but the hidden man of the heart, the one who's in us. That's his relation. That's where his relation is sure and certain. It has never been sure and certain to people. It's always been to the Son. And with the Son that lives in the soul. We've come to a a reality where none of those distinctions are valid. God has no relation to those distinctions of flesh. His relation to you is His Son. And that's it. That's as simple as I can say it. His relation to you is His Son. This is further elaborated in chapter 9 when we're seeing the election of God and the choosing of one and in that the disregard of the other. Choosing the second, disregarding the first. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And in Malachi, we've previously talked about, that's how he defines his love toward Israel. How have you loved us, Israel? Or how have you loved us? I have loved you. How have you loved us? Jacob have I loved. Esau I have hated. And he goes on to elaborate how he's destroyed the habitation in the cities of Esau. Of Edom. Leaving nothing but his beloved one. That's his love to us. I have loved one seed. I have loved one son. And his love toward us, the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit is that the son he loves now lives in us and cries out, Abba, Father. 
He has brought in that son a relationship with himself that we had no hope of, except that son be that relationship in us. Let me read Romans 9.28 for a second. This will be... This will be important as we go. I have great grief and unceasing pain. This is from the Young's Literal Translation. In my heart, for I was wishing, I myself, to be anathema from Christ, for my brethren, my kindred, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, whose is the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the law-giving and the service and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom... Is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all God blessed to the ages? Amen. It is not possible that the word of God has failed. For not all who are of Israel are these Israel, nor because they are the seed of Abraham are all children. But in Isaac shall a seed be called to thee. See, all of these things were given as promises to Israel, but not to seeds as of many, but to the seed who is Christ. And what Paul is saying to them, and I wish we could all understand this in our theology and in our eschatology, is that God was nev- God never obligated himself to people. His obligation was to his seed with whom his covenant was made. Therefore, when a bunch of people are still waiting on God to fulfill his obligations, it is because we still have the people and the many in view. When our souls behold the seed, the son with whom his covenant was made, ratified, and in whom his covenant is sure, we see that his obligation was always to him. And he has unto that son given all things. It has pleased God that all fullness, the fullness of the promised blessings, the fullness of the inheritance, the fullness of the covenant, the fullness of all things, be found in that son, be bestowed to that son. You see that God has obligated himself to one son and he has fulfilled the promise unto that one. And if we are born of that son, if that son lives in us, then we are partakers of the promises fulfilled. We are partakers of the inheritance fulfilled because that son lives in us as the promises and the inheritance fully provided and given. Because they are embodied in his person. So he goes on and he's taking it out and saying they have rejected this, but the word of God, the promise of God, the oath of God has not been nullified. Just what Romans 3 says, they will not, their disbelief or unbelief will not nullify the faith of God. It is not nullified in their unbelief. God has certified it, he has promised it, and he has fulfilled it in his seed. Let me read this in the um, the Weiss translation. But the case is not that the word of God has fallen powerless, for not all, all, not all who are out of Israel, naturally, are Israel. Nor because they are the offspring, natural offspring of Abraham, are all children. But in Isaac an offspring or a seed shall be named for you. You see that? He's bringing it to the seed, not to the many, not to the natural descendants, not to those people. He's brought it into the seed. They cannot say God is unrighteous because he hasn't fulfilled anything. He has promised. No, he gave his son to them as the fulfillment of the promises. The problem was, just like with the Christianity today, we want the fulfillment and the fullness and the blessings and the riches divorced from him. 
We don't want to know them as who He will be unto us. We want to know them as something God gives to us as our own. Or we'll go out and produce something of our own. A righteousness of our own, as Paul talks about in Romans 9 as well. In Romans 10. In Isaac a seed. One seed. In Isaac, not in Ishmael, in Isaac there is a seed. That's not the children of the flesh. These are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For the word of God, or the word of promise is this, according to the season I will come, and there will be to Sarah a son. Not only, but also Rebekah, conceiving by one Isaac our father, for not yet having been born, nor having practiced any good or evil. Listen to those words. Talking about Jacob and Esau, they had yet to be born. They had not done or practiced anything good or anything evil. The things that we believe determine our standing with God. Have I done enough good? What am I doing evil? I need to stop. And he's saying here they had done none of that. They have not practiced any good or evil in order that the purpose or intention of God dominated by an act of selection, the word election is there, of His selecting out may abide. That the election of God, the choosing of God, the word in the Hebrew is the the fixed gaze of God. When He says, Remember when we talked about it in, in, according to the rod of Aaron, he says, the rod upon whom I am fixed, it's the same word as chosen here. The one I choose, but the one I am fixed upon, that one shall bloom and blossom and bring forth fruit. This is what he's talking about. He has fixed his gaze and his eternal delight upon one. And disregarded all but that one. And it was not because they had done good works or bad works. But because his choosing was the predominant reality. His choosing. The one he has chosen. If it was because Esau did bad and Jacob did good or vice versa, then it would no longer be of grace. It would no longer be a reality of faith accessing grace. It would be the law. Because the works would have determined God's relationship to them. But God's choosing of one determined his relation to Israel. You see that? The one chosen of God determined his relationship of love toward them. Paul is defining Israel. Who is the real Jew? The one elected, the one chosen. Is that you or me? No, that is Christ, the seed. So it may be dominated not of a source of works, but out of the source of the one who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, even as it stands written, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated. Keep in mind the one who calls. That will, that will be important and dealt with as we go. Now, Let's, let's uh, go on into Romans 11, and we'll be talking again about Romans 9 as we go. I want to kind of compare the two, um, and some other verses we'll bring in. Romans chapter 11. We're going to look first. We're just going to pick out a few verses here. I don't want to read the whole verse. Read the whole verse, if you will, because it's beautiful when you look at it. He's not, first of all, let's look at this. He's not speaking about people. He, he uses the terms, he's, yes, the Jews and the Gentiles. But the whole point is, where is the salvation of the Jew and the Gentile? What is the salvation? Has he rejected one people and brought in another people? He'll say, no, he has not rejected his people. But their disbelief in him, their disbelief has been a benefit to the Gentiles because they could be grafted in. 
And see, that's what it's about. It's the one in whom it's the it's the vine or the tree that they are grafted into. It has nothing to do with them. And you'll see this. It has to do with the seed. It has to do with the selection that we've just talked about in in Romans 9. God's choosing of one seed. God's choosing of one son. Now, Romans 11, verse 7. Or let's, let's read up. Verse 5, even so then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There's the word again, election of grace. But see, that remnant is not measured, and remember this, you have to keep this in mind. That remnant is not measured in people or many or small. Whether it be many people or small amount of people. The remnant, even in the testimony, was never with regard to that. We'll look at that in another verse we've already touched on. It's always the seed that determines the remnant. Uh, the verse, we, we've looked at that verse before. I think it was in Romans 4, and I have it written here somewhere, Romans 4. Except God had left us a seed, we should have been like unto Sodom and Gomorrah. Not, oh, if God wouldn't have saved a bunch of people. No, that's not Paul's meaning. Paul's bringing that to its spiritual fulfillment. And showing that except God had a seed in view when He's dealing with all of us and dealing with His people and dealing with the soul of men, unless, except His relation to us be a seed, unless the seed of God remains as His constant object that occupies His view, we're all hopeless. We'd be just like Sodom and Gomorrah, none righteous found there, destroyed, never to be seen again, having no hope of relation with God. No hope at all, except the seed remain. It's about the seed. This is the point he's making in the whole letter to the Romans. That was in Romans. Well, anyway, he goes on here. Even so, then at this present time, there remaineth a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath obtained, hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. I want you to see this now. Again, keeping in mind, when he's talking about the remnant, and he's talking about the the election, it's the remnant according to grace. What is that? It's those who are found in the seed. Those who have come to the seed, who are born of the seed of promise. You have to look at Romans 11. Again, you can't detach it from what he's been saying in the previous parts of this letter. Talking about Israel is not a bunch of people. So when we read Romans 11, we can't think about, oh, God's going to bring back these bunch of people called Jews and save all of them. Because he's talking about all of Israel being saved. But he's quoting that. All of Israel will be saved. Yes. And he's defining that salvation. He's already defined it previously in this letter. It's the salvation that is found in the seed, the elect one. It is a salvation that is secured and certain in the election. God's choosing of one. Jacob have I loved. And he's saying in this thing, the only salvation they'll ever have, he said in this very chapter, the only salvation they have is the same salvation the Gentiles have, and that is life from the dead. To be born of the living one. 
Born of Him who is dead unto sin and alive unto God. To become dead to sin and alive unto God through Him. That's the only salvation they have that they would be grafted in or brought back into the One. And in that, we'll read it later, they would partake of the heritage or the inheritance that they forsook. When He came and confirmed the covenant to these Jews, He came confirming it as Himself. He came as the certainty of that covenant because he came as the heir of the covenant and said, if you will partake of any part of this covenant, which is what we read of in Romans 9, all of the blessings, all of the glory, the adoption, all of that that pertained to them by testimony, he came and said, if you will have any of this, if you will know any of this, if you will partake of any of this, you must come to me and partake of it as me. I will be that unto you. I will be the blessings of the covenant to you. Now, the election hath obtained it. But this little phrase stopped me. When I was reading this verse, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. He seeketh for. And in the Greek there, it's a word continual. It's active. It's a continual word. Not that they sought after, but they're still seeking it. Even at the time he's writing this letter, they were still seeking after something, and yet they haven't obtained it. This is in Romans 9 as well, where we just read. It's, uh, this is uh, verse 29. As Isaiah said before, except the Lord, this is, okay, it's Romans 9, I'm sorry. Romans 9 is where we were. Except the Lord of hosts hath left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? The Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness have obtained to righteousness, even the righteousness that is of faith. See that? There's the attaining. There's the attaining. They talk about what they have sought after. They sought after righteousness. They sought after holiness. They sought after spiritual reality. They sought after a relationship with God. They sought after all of that. They sought after the blessings of the messianic fulfillment that was to come. Everything he would, that they desired was that in the, in, in the coming of the Messiah, he would bring all the blessings promised. All the riches and fullness and inheritance that God had promised unto them. And they sought to be in a position where they would be qualified for such an enjoyment of such blessings. Because they adhered or adhered to the law perfectly. They were seeking after. They have yet to attain it. Paul said, being ignorant. Why have they not attained it? Being ignorant of the righteousness of God. They go about to establish their own. They're ignorant of righteousness as it truly is. So they go and establish one as they imagine it to be. They have obtained what they didn't even seek after. They weren't under the law. The Gentiles weren't under the law, but they obtained the righteousness of the law in the seed. By faith, knowing Him to be the end of the law for righteousness' sake. Being in them the righteousness of the law fulfilled. All of these things I'm saying, all of these quotes are in Romans. Romans 8, Romans 3. They sought these things by zeal, but yet ignorant. 
those who have found and obtained have found it in knowledge, the knowledge of God. Apprehending and possessing Christ as the substance of everything they sought for. Obtaining it in and as who he is. That's the attainment of faith. And that is the reality that God would make known in the soul of every believer. Most believers today are still in the condition they are looking, seeking for something. They still believe they're lacking something of spiritual fullness. They're still lacking something. So they have to do this or do that to to bolster up their relationship with God. And what I'm telling you is you'll do that until the day you die, until you see Him. And then you'll see the election has obtained it. The chosen one is the obtaining. Laying hold of the elected one, the one elect, the one chosen, the one upon whose face the gaze of the Father is eternally set. In the seeing of Him, we'll see it is already attained and already provided and bestowed by the grace of God to our soul. I must know him. How are you going to know the fullness and riches and beauty of this salvation? Knowing Him who is the fullness and riches and beauty of this salvation. Because in that we are coming to know even as we are known of God. Not I, but Christ. The election hath obtained it. The election has obtained it. Not works, not efforts, not religion. The election, the one chosen. Not a bunch of people, not people at all. The election has obtained it because it's the seed. They by faith are beholding Him made unto them all things of righteousness. All things the law demanded but could not provide. They have attained everything they sought after because he is the object. He's called the hope of the nations, the expectation of the ages. He is what they sought, and for us, we see it realized and fulfilled in us. That's who he is. Let's go on in Romans 9 here. I, I want to just read this more. We've been likened to Sodom and Gomorrah. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who followed not after righteousness. That means according to the law. They didn't follow after the law of righteousness. They have attained to righteousness, the righteousness which is of faith. Isn't that the righteousness Paul said he finally came to when he saw Christ? The excellency of the beholding of him He counted the righteousness he once boasted in as nothing and said, Now I desire to be found in him, having no righteousness of my own, but the righteousness that is of faith. That's the righteousness. He attained the righteousness of the law because he attained it in righteousness himself. He attained it in the righteous one, the righteousness of God. And he submitted himself unto a, 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 a righteousness that exceeded what he used to believe righteousness was. The righteousness of faith. But, in, but Israel, that followed, this is natural, which followed after the law, hath not obtained to the law of righteousness. Because they sought it not by faith. They sought it as something divorced from him. They sought it to be something they could one day see in themselves than something that they have to see in Him and as Him. It is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. And we've talked about this. This is the offense. That it is nothing I could ever be or become. It's always who He is. Never who I am. Whosoever believeth or has faith on him shall not be ashamed. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. 
You're going to read in, in Romans 11, Israel, all Israel shall be saved. How is that? Bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They, being ignorant of God's righteousness, go about to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law. For righteousness to everyone that believeth. How are they saved? Faith in the one. Salvation is the one who is the end of the law. Because the law was what? We read it in in Galatians 3. The law was until the seed should come. And it's also said not just the seed should come, but faith should come. Whose faith? The faith of God that could never be nullified by the unbelief of the Jew. The faith of God came. The seed unto whom the promises came because they're one and the same. That is the salvation of Israel. When, when, when we come to the true meaning of the phrase, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. What is the salvation of Israel? Being found in the son, even the firstborn. It's not about a bunch of people still existing as a nation God still looks at as, as valuable. It's about the Son. It's about the seed and being found in Him. That's the salvation He's talking about. All of Israel is saved because the Son, who is Israel, will live in them. And those in whom that seed lives is Israel because Israel is my son. It's not about people. It's not about many. It's about one. This is the knowledge of God with regard to us. Not about us. Not about any. It's about Him. It's defined in Him, measured in Him. Exclusively and fully. Perfectly. Remember 1 Corinthians 1, 30. We know that. He has made unto us all things of spiritual reality. Now, let's continue in Romans 11. For I would not, brethren, that you, this is verse 25, that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall, not come, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they, the Jews, are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God or without repentance. For as ye in times past had not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy. Listen to the word mercy. Mercy. Now we're going we're gonna to look at this mercy uh, in, in some verses here late, later. Oh, the depth, mercy, he's concluded all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon them all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. First of all, let's address this. As touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Why? Why? Because God dealt with this people in view of his son. And in so doing, he made promises to the fathers. Now, we're going to look at those uh, verses in just a second. 
as touching the election, remember, the election in Romans 9 says the, that the purpose of God according to the election may stand or remain. It remains as a, as a settled and an unrevocable reality. Galatians 3, remember, when a covenant is made, it cannot be nullified or added to. It's the same thing we're talking about. The election, choosing of one son, cutting a covenant with one seed in whom he knows an entire people. One seed. This is the election that's obtained it when they come to be found and known in that one seed. By faith. Or found in him, having nothing of their own, but being filled with the fullness that he is. This obtains it. This is what attains spiritual reality. But what does it mean that he is, they are beloved for the Father's sake? That, again, that has nothing to do with a bunch of people. Here's some verses. Luke chapter 1, 67 through 75. And Zechariah's father was filled with the Holy Spirit and did prophesy, saying, Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel. He did look upon and wrought redemption for his people. He did raise a horn of salvation to us in the house of David his servant, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which has been from the ages, or, or from the ages, salvation from our enemies, and out of the hand of all who are hating us, to do kindness with our fathers, and to be mindful of his holy covenant, an oath that he swear to Abraham our father. Deuteronomy 7, 5 through 9. But this thou dost to them, thus thou dost to them, their altars ye break down, their standing pillars you shiver, and their shrines you cut down, and their graven images you burn with fire. For a holy people art thou to Jehovah thy God. On thee hath Jehovah thy God fixed, or set his gaze, to be to him for a peculiar people. Out of all the people who are on the face of the earth or face of the ground, as it says here, not because of you being more numerous than any of the people hath he delighted in you or fixed on you, for ye are the least of all the people, but because of Jehovah's loving you and because of his keeping the oath which he swore to the fathers. Hath Jehovah brought you out by a strong hand and doth ransom you from a house of servants for the hand of Jehovah king, uh, from the hand of, Je- uh, of Pharaoh, king of Egypt? And thou hast known that Jehovah thy God, he is God, the faithful God, keeping covenant and the kindness to those who love him and are those keeping his commands to a thousand generations. He is the God who keepeth covenant to a thousand generations. But he did this because of his oath to the fathers, the thing he had sworn to the fathers. This is what Romans 11 is talking about. First Chronicles 16, verse 13. You seed of Israel, you his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is Jehovah our God. His judgments are all in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations which is the covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. And he confirmed the same unto Jacob, to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Remember, this certifies that the law, that the the promise and the covenant that he gave unto Abraham and the seed, he confirmed unto Jacob and Israel when he gave the law. He didn't abrogate it. It was confirmed in the law because it was holding that promise until the seed of promise came. Uh, let's see, Acts, this is now, we go to the New Covenant in Acts where we have here Peter in verse 21, whom the heaven must receive, uh, verse 20, and he shall, send, he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began For Moses said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. 
And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. And all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God has raised up his son Jesus and sent him to bless you. See that? Send him to bless you. Not give you a bunch of stuff. Send him as the blessing unto you. The blessing promise that he's talking about here. Turn away every one of you from your iniquities. Now, well, Acts chapter 13. Paul says this. Again, we're talking about why are they beloved unto the fathers. Not because of them, but it's God keeping a covenant he made with the fathers. And how does he keep it? He fulfills it in the person of the Son. It's, it's a realized reality. Something done. And this is chapter 13 of Acts 29. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. This is Paul. But God raised, this, God's, this is Paul speaking. But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you the glad tidings, or the gospel, how that the promise, again referring to the promise, made unto seed, not seeds, but to the seed, promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in the raising up of Jesus again. Again, it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee. See, he has fulfilled what he has promised, the oath he made to the fathers. This is why they are beloved. Israel is beloved. He did not desire for any of them to be lost, but all to come to salvation. But the salvation they were all to come to was Christ. Not something they had on the side apart from Christ, but that they would come to be found in the seed of promise, the heir of promise. They sought to have the inheritance on their own. And we do the same thing. It's found or known or partaken of and apprehended as Him or it's never going to be apprehended. He's not saying God still loves all those people. He's saying they are beloved because they, to, to them first was a testimony given. To them first, God spoke unto their fathers and gave unto them the covenants and the blessings and the glory and the promises. But now He has fulfilled all those things in the risen Son. And for their salvation to be, for them to all be saved, they must find their salvation in Israel himself. This is a covenant made of God with his seed. I want to show you how sure this is. And it's sure not because it is not unto us, but unto that one seed. See, we read this earlier. God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Now this is Romans 11. This is that mercy we're talking about. This is the mercy we're going to look at when we're seeing that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Romans chapter 3 verse 9. What then are we better than they? The Jew or the Gentile? The, no, and no wise. For we have been proved, both Jews and Gentiles, they are all under sin. Galatians chapter 3 talks about they were all the law or the scripture concluded all men under sin. Uh, this is uh, verse 19. 
Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. A mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which should have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that have faith. That believe. Before faith came, we were shut up, kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we may be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer a schoolmaster. You are all the children of God by faith in Christ. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ where there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. You see what he's saying here? He, that's why he brings it. There is neither Jew nor Gentile being baptized into Christ. That means being crucified with Christ where it is not I but Christ that lives. We're in that reality of neither Jew nor Gentile. And that's what we think he's talking about in Romans 11. Whether the Jews are going to have a, a good standing with God again or whether he's cast them away forever. No, their salvation is the same as the Gentiles. The seed. The son. He concluded all under sin that he might have mercy. What is that mercy? It is a salvation that is of Him and not of us. It is that He would be made, He would not leave us in the state of sin. He would not leave us in the state where we could never fulfill the righteous demands. He would give His Son to the soul as the righteousness demanded. He would give His Son at, to the soul as the promises Fulfilled. He would give His Son to our soul as the inheritance promised. He would give His Son to the soul as everything we had no hope of except He do so. That's the mercy He has had upon all. And that is how all Israel are saved by that very mercy. And by faith we partake of that great salvation. It's the election. See, I can't even put words to it right now. It's too fresh in my own heart. But the election has obtained it. You understand that? God hasn't left it up to you to attain it. He has attained it already in the election. I have chosen one to the seed who is Christ. Jacob have I loved. That's the election that has attained this righteousness that we could never attain. That is why He has made unto us righteousness and justification, sanctification, redemption, wisdom, life, glory. All of the things of the blessing. All of the things Roman 9 talks about. And that's where we're going to start in the next class because that has everything to do with with the gifts and the callings of God that are without repentance. He has not changed His mind. This is not what we have been taught. And I know I've been taught it all my life. Oh, you messed up. You did bad. You did bad things. You went out in the world. Oh, well, take heart. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You're still called to preach or you're still this or that. It has nothing to do with you. That's why it's without repentance. It was settled before in Christ. The callings and gifts of God are without repentance because it's settled in one seed. And we're going to look at that uh, in the next class. We're out of time.